Well, this will be a, I'm gonna share my screen. I have a presentation. I just wanted to let everyone know this will be a high level overview. I have a link at the end of the presentation if you wanna take a deep dive into the theoretical components of it. So um, I believe Valerie's on the call and he's taken a, the past several years, he wrote his PhD in it. Um, his dissertation advisor happened to be one of the giants in the field. So, uh, you know, that resource will be there. I'm not shamelessly plugging him. It's just, it's a, it's a great resource with over 2000 different uh, accessible items from uh, Python code, R code, and even some implementation advice. Because at the end of the day, what we want is we want to take what we're what we're learning here and apply it in a practical way. So, you know, taking it from the academic realm and apply it. So with that being said, let me share my screen quickly. All right, so the reason I I entitled this um, Powering Executives for Informed Decisions is forecasting, you know, time series forecasting is more important than ever, I believe. And the reason for that is if you want to make investments into advanced machine learning, generative AI, large language models, or just you want to reduce inventory spend. You want to give a clearer picture to an audience who's not technical. You need to have a great way to distill information. And there's over 60 different forecasting methodologies, metrics, and that's probably I'm light on that number. So you're going to see one talked about here. It's called MAPE. I'm not making fun of it. I just found some data that from an executive point of view, I would want you to look at. And then theoretically, there's some gaps in it as well that perhaps informal prediction intervals can fill. And please note that talk with your data science team, look at your data, look at your industry vertical and make the best decision based on your situation. So. Why do we talk about forecasting? Why do we have this society? Why are people interested in it? Well, my take on it is that forecasting looks straightforward until you start forecasting. So that's the illusion of validity. So if anyone's read uh, Daniel Kahneman's work and uh, Human Judgment, he won the 2002 Nobel Prize in Economics. It appears simple until you start putting all the environmental variables and all the socioeconomic variables. So the next couple of slides we're gonna look at, you know, you've probably heard this term a lot, you know, my gut judgment or my clinical judgment and even mechanical judgment where we're using regression and forecasting. And you'll probably think, well, if we're using founded principles, we're probably going to be pretty well above guessing. And this example here has two people. So you'd have a 50% chance. So, and this instrument here would have all the acceptable academic and industry criteria of it would be a good construct. It would have good criterion. It would have good content external validity. External validity is if I create it and, I, and I'm in financial services and I give it to a manufacturing company, they can measure the same thing. So if it's about employee turnover and it's a survey, it works in different industries. It just doesn't apply to one specific area. And that's from page 111 of the book. If you don't have it, I uh, highly recommend reading it because it talks a lot about human judgment. Human judgment impacts forecasting significantly. So how good is you know, clinical intuition? When someone says, well, they have a gut feeling about a candidate or they have a gut feeling about what demand could look like 
you know, what does that look like when someone really breaks it down and then looks at it? So we can see that this is a pretty simple instrument. Most of the forecasting we're dealing with is far more complex. So from this really simply, relatively simple instrument that predicts performance, okay, so we're introducing human psychology here, a lot of variability, which most of our forecasts have, right? So that's the reason I use this example. We can see the scores here, and we can see that Monica has 30 and Natalie has 37. So on average, they're 1.4 apart on the instrument, so the average score between the components. So that's clinical judgment. So you're just using quick calculations, intuition, and deciding. So now that this clinical predictions happened with performance evaluations, this was performed by a terminally degreed psychologist. So someone who had a PhD, likely organizational, industrial and organizational psychologist was 55%. So those clinical predictions are 5% above chance, which means chance is simply, we pick one of the two and we see how they turn out in the position. So we put this together, we use our clinical judgment, we're 5% above chance. So now we introduce mechanical prediction. So it must be a lot better, right? So given the valid instrument, Natalie's mechanical prediction, this was a multiple uh, linear regression, I believe, that they used in the book, yields a correlation of 0.32. So now we're at 60%. So for human variability, that's, that's not bad. But what's missing is the other 40%, and that's noise. And we're going to talk about noise a few times through this presentation. But even with mechanical, mechanical prediction and a valid instrument created by terminally degreed IO psychologists, we're 10% above chance. And, you know, I don't mention adjusted R squared in this presentation, but if you look at some models and they say they have an adjusted R squared of 0.62, that still means that there's 38% of external factors that aren't counting, that aren't accounted for, that are potentially impacting the predictor, predicting or impacting the variable. So noise is an unavoidable reality, right? So if we're, say we're, a, we're doing predictions for predictive maintenance, we have ships. We can have a general idea of what the conditions are, are out on the sea, but we can't have an exact we don't know at this latitude and this longitude that the water is going to be that temperature all the time that you know the chop or the wave height is going to be this we don't know exactly how the captain is going to drive it every time so there's that there's that noise there's while we could get close we could have sensors we could have a great program there's still going to be noise it's it's an unavoidable reality so there's no guaranteed method for separating the two. But the reason that I'm introducing, and many of you have probably heard of conformal prediction intervals already, is that it provides a, a simplistic manner to sort out the predictions. So, and you're going to see why that I believe, if you look at the other methodologies that are available that when you look at these conformal prediction intervals that it's intuitive and if you take it up a level where you have a non-technical audience it's not that executives don't have the ability to understand the intricacies of data science and time series forecasting it's that when you're briefing a high level audience you want to get to the bottom line up front and to me and backed by you know going on 25 years of research 
you can see that over the course of time, conformal prediction and specifically conformal prediction intervals have been broken down and made easier to understand and more accessible. So why do we use them? So first of all, we want to enhance decision making. With a forecast, we're, we're making we want to make operational decisions. That's the point of a forecast. If we look two years out from the last actuals, right? So last actuals, say September of 2023 would be our last actuals. And then we look at October of 2023 to October of 2025. We're using a two-year period here for simplicity reasons. We want to make we want to have an idea of what's going to happen. Now, will it be perfect? No, but if we can look ahead and say, well, you know, there's unfavorable conditions or we're going to have a larger amount of equipment down for extensive maintenance, you know, how do we start planning for that now to minimize the impact? Very common in logistics where you're looking ahead and you're saying, well, what's the demand? Or if you're looking at personnel, you'll, you'll look ahead and say, well, here's what we're manufacturing. Here's how many people it took. If there's a downturn and we're sitting on 800 or 1,000 extra FTE, what's that going to do to the net income or operational revenue? It's going to likely negatively impact it. So enhanced decision making. Adaptability. So you don't have to make strong assumptions about the data. So you'll see some things out in popular press. I call popular press just, you know, out at conferences and other things where you'll get a little pushback and they'll say that you have to have X amount of months or perhaps even two years worth of data. There is no theoretical proof of that claim. So can you do it with one day worth of data? No, I'm not going to say that you can do it with one day worth of data. But do you need 24 months of prior data to do it? Um, the answer would be no. There's no theoretical backing to that at this time. So it's versatile. And you can use it for there's all types of applications that use it and all types of data sets. So in reliability, so we're looking at, sometimes we're looking at single estimates. Well, the confidence interval, we're looking at, well, what will we need? Let's say we're ordering something for a, a chain of grocery stores. We have five grocery stores within 30 miles and we're, and we're predicting demand for product A. Well, how much do we need to order and have on hand so we can stock the shelves and the customers can have access to it without spoilage? So we'll look at you know, a confidence interval of 80.25 to 101. That's just a single estimate. So the prediction intervals will give you a more structured approach and you're gonna see that here in the slides and you're gonna see the expected range and the and the theoretical guarantee of what that value is going to be. So, what is conformal prediction? You know, conformal prediction, providing a confidence level to each prediction made. So, what this prediction error is doing is. It's looking at it and it's saying, well, how can we minimize error and are the numbers within the band? So you can see at the second bullet, you know, if we have values within that prediction interval, 95% of the time we can pick a value out of that interval and that will be the actual value looking forward. So if we were to go back and say, we, we, we completed, we completed our time series forecasting. We had these conformal prediction intervals. Let's pick a value and see on the trend line or on the forecasting line if that value actually came to fruition, right? Because 
forecasting is looking at what the potential values are. And when we're looking post hoc, we could pick a value and 95% of the time that value will lie within that prediction range. So it gives you a relatively solid foundation to make decisions on. Now, is this the only thing you should make decisions on? We'll talk about that in a few slides. Of course not. But it, you know, let's we could look at this next slide. So this was a this was a analysis done on uh, Nixla's uh, stats forecast uh, medium, and uh, we can see here we have the horizon. We have a list with the confidence levels of the prediction. For this case, we're going to use 90 because that's what I have on the next graph. And we can see that that these numbers are relatively easy to read. We use seasonal. We have that at 80 and 90. We have um, Arima 80, 90. And you can see that with these unique IDs and these points in time, you know, as the time elapses, we can get the nuance. It doesn't, it provides a specific point and we can look across and say, well, if we need something more sensitive, you know, if you were in engineering, you wouldn't use 90 or it should use 99, generally 95, but for this case, we use 90. You can see that if we go to the next slide, we have the timestamp and the value. And we can look, based on this time, we can say our value is going to be between 1450 and 2750. So that's for this unique ID right here. So rather than, all right, so now we've generated these numbers. We've got to do something, you know, that's singular based. You can look at these charts. If you run this in Python, this was ran in Python. There are options for conformal prediction in R and Julia. So this is not a singular, this is not a unitasker. It's another reason that from an industrial standpoint, from a from a practical application, you don't have to change everything you're doing to accommodate and formal prediction intervals you can uh there's several options where you can add it in to your current forecasting regimen in a relatively straightforward manner without the purchase of something proprietary so what do we care about when we're talking about for forecasting we care about the actual value because if we're going to make management decisions, I don't know if you've heard of management exceptions, but generally when you have a forecast, you'll have these overlays that the business generates depending on industry and they'll say, okay, well, you forecasted, you know, the data team forecasted, we're going to make 27, we'll go with yachts at this, at this, uh, for this example. Now the business is looking at raw material and everything else and they'll say, well, you know, our priors say that we're around 31. So we're around 27 to 31, that would be that interval. So we wouldn't wanna buy supplies for raw material for 35 and we don't wanna buy raw material for 25 either. So you'd have the management overlay so they would use this line right here and i'm i'm pointing at the screen they would overlay something to this line and they would say okay our expected range lies within the conformal prediction interval and then you can spring forward and make decisions based off that criteria so rarely is a forecast, what I'm saying for the people that might be new to forecast, time series forecasting, rarely does a data scientist generate a time series forecast and that decision immediately goes into implementation where an executive says, you know, that's great, Matt, I trust you fully. 
they're going to sit back with overlays and say, okay, well, this is what we have. This is what you have. And the idea is to get those between management expectations and what the data team generates as close as possible. Because if we're forecasting and someone's having to redo it, not a lot of value there, right? So you probably see me talk about MAPE. So what's the rub with mean absolute percentage error? Well, I'm glad you asked. So someone, let me get his name quick. Johan Robet. So Johan, Johan Robet did this great study with the M5 competition data. And we can see with this graphic, we have MAPE over here to the far right. This was something that they created. Um, take that with a grain of salt. I'm not making fun of the firm. I'm just when something's all ones, your uh, your senses should go off, right? So we can look at these metrics and costs by aggregation, and we can look at these correlations with here's here's would be the here would be the management criteria. So if we're looking at this, we can say that you know, 0, 0.0 to 0 0.2 negligible, weak, moderate, strong is 0 0.61, and very strong is 0 0.81. If we go down on MAPE with this data set, we have no ranked correlation above the moderate range. So the correlation between metrics and cost we don't rise above the moderate range. So what does that do to what is that, you know, what does that do to decision making? So the most often used forecasting metric, which MAPE is is the worst in this context. Now, every context is different. But for this particular set of items, metrics and costs, we're looking at category, state. So this would be a retail store. We're looking at store number, where it's located, what the subcategory is. So how we would stock our shelves. So if we were forecasting demand for items, we would have at best what we saw, the best met the best score would have moderate strength to tie that relationship together. So where we talked about informal prediction intervals having that form or that confidence of a reasonable guarantee you know, backed by 25 years of research mape which has been around much longer when we put it to the data and we look at it and say well what is it actually measuring and how is it tying the relationship together oftentimes you're going to be you'll have disappointment there. And with that, with those relationships, as the relationships start to drift, the predictive power and that forecasting power that you've just spent all that time, resources, energy, and personnel on will likely have to be adjusted consistently. So management expectations or management judgment, you'll see that injected a lot into forecast. The more that's injected, what that's saying is that that initial forecast was wrong to the point to where it had to be manipulated. So from an initial decision standpoint, 
it causes you to constantly have to go back and forth. So how does this turn to dollars? So we see MAPE up here with being expensive. And you can see here root mean square of approximation. We really, you know, the average decision cost is the higher it is, the, the less ideal that we're looking at from, from our perspective of, of how we would make decisions and how that would impact us financially. So we can see that the forecasting period here, very small, 2.88 million in sales, but for a, for a medium-sized business, 2.88 million in sales is, is large. So it's made it's made light here, but I don't want to make light of if you're a, if you're a small to medium sized business using uh, demand forecasting, that number is much bigger. So we have to be considerate of that. Oftentimes in the in the academic literature, we'll see very large companies, and we'll see these small percentages. But as we look at that number for a smaller business, those decisions become become even more important because it's an opportunity to, to maximize revenue and minimize extraneous costs. So if we order, if we're at a grocery, if we run a grocery store and we order too much, that residual waste goes into the dumpster, it's not sold. Even if you have, you know, insurance mediums to cover some of the waste, you're not gonna be made whole through that. So just looking at MAPE, because there were several, there's, there's, if you've ever looked at any of these M4, M5 competitions, there's a, there's a treasure trove of different mediums used. But we're looking at MAPE here. So for the three-week period, it was, it was 900. There was, uh, it was, yeah, 900.3 thousand for the 3,000 items for three weeks. So now we can imagine the cost, that was the overrun. So this is an overrun number. So cost overrun of 9.3 thousand for under 5,000 items in 10 stores for three weeks. So that's it's about five dollars and thirty cents for each item in each store. So make that number fifty thousand, hundred thousand, a million, and put that number there. If we were to scale this at, you know, they Johan scaled it at Walmart scale by the potential cost to overrun at Walmart by using MAPE is 1.8 billion a year, and that's in 2020 dollars. It's over a percent of Walmart's annual gross revenue and under a percent of the annual turnover. So when we extrapolate, we take something small and we look at it from a very reduce scale, but we scale it, if we apply the same principles, you know, and if, I believe Walmart's a fortune, is number one on the fortune 500 list, 1.8 billion. So if we were to go to Target, which is further down the list, considerably, it's the potential that Target's at a billion dollars. So now imagine if you ran these 10 stores, if you're you know, if you're a non, if for our non-academic audience in here, imagine if you run 10 stores and every three weeks, your re replenishment costs are overran by $9,000. Or for a year in the UK, 9,000 pound. You know, or if you're one of the European Union countries, 9,000 euro. 
And that's significant. And that's just replenishment cost. Now imagine, you know, add on the additional time and labor if you're trying to get rid of something that's perishable. You know, in the U.S., that process is relatively straightforward, but outside of the United States, not so much. There's, there's many other laws that you have to consider. You know, and one of the things I, I had a question on was, is conformal prediction a fad? It's not from a uh, theoretical or practical standpoint. So... It's mentioned in uh, Gammerman's Vapnik and Volk, Vapnik and Volk are two, and Gammerman as well. I think the last time I checked between the three of them, they had over 300,000 citations. And Vapnik worked extensively in industry, not to mention he's an academic giant. So <clears throat> he was at AT&T Labs, if I'm not mistaken. So you have 25 years of backing here. So this isn't something that when I got interested in it, it came out a couple months ago. It's, it's been around. It's being used right now in financial services. It's being used in uh, autonomous driving. It's being used at, it was used at Husqvarna recently that was a 2023 paper that'll be on the last link uh the ex that link is updated i believe daily or at least several times a week with the newest uh, happenings in conformal prediction so it's being used right now out like what i would call out in the wild so it's not this isn't sitting in an academic lab just spinning up and then number three you have options. I just Nick, I listed Nixolo and Mapey. There's Scikit Learn. There's other options. I'm not limiting. I just listed two immediately that you could go, and if you put them into Google, you'd find a lot of great information. You can use them in multiple programming languages. You don't have to have infrastructure, so or proprietary software. So I'm not making fun of SAS, SPSS, Stata or off-the-shelf forecasting solutions, but each of these costs money per user. Then you have to build out your strategies in them, and then you have regular upkeep and cost associated with proprietary software. Now, open source doesn't mean free. You have to have the infrastructure to run it. You have to have the qualified professionals to run it, but as the updates are pushed you gather them as well so you're not having to buy an add-on you're not having to buy you know additional things number two is if you sit with your it team and you make package repos repositories for python and r you can have them readily accessible to your data team so they can pull them in you can do the proper cybersecurity checks. Don't go pip install things on your, you know, if you're if you're at a company right now, don't go pip install random things on your on your work computer. Run it through one of your package managers. I'm trying to remember a Frogger's one of the package managers. You can run it through the package manager so it can do checks on it. It can sweep it for any potential, you know, bugs, malware, anything like that. Please do that, especially if you're, you know, not using your own computer. Even if you are using your own computer, do your due diligence. But you can make these packages, you can make these YAML files, and you can set yourself up to have repeatable analyses types for your team. And on the executive side, over the course of time, as you have those repeatable analyses that are that are tweaked based off socioeconomic conditions and other items that we'll talk about here in a bit, you can get used to that data and you can get used to those decision points where if SAS says they're going to do something different, 
they rarely call you as an executive and say, hey, we're thinking about changing SAS via to, to this. What do you think? Or if you use Stata, I've seen SPSS and some uh, people analytics firms, they don't call and say, we're going to do this with our forecasting tools. What do you think? Where here, you can say, well, I want to use stats forecast for one item, and I want to use maybe for another. You can do that. And you can base it off the data, the business vertical, and the external factors that you're dealing with. So those three items are, are huge. You know, is it intensive programmatically? Let me know if it's... Uh, Because I don't know if it stayed on the presentation or not. Let me uh, reshare my screen here. Just doing a quick reshare. There we go. So you can see, and I just put this in. I just put this in a, in a Google Collab notebook, credit to Valerie and the, and the Nixla team for uh, writing this. You know, relatively straightforward install. We're not using, I call it the import train a lot, where we're not using a ton of packages to get this done. So this is from the M4 competition. We can see our, our data here. We're generating prediction intervals. So just eight series of data. With stats forecast, if you open this in, if you open this in Google Collab, you'll see the stats forecast, the plots. But what I want to go down to and show you is this. So we saw this earlier. We can take, in a relatively short amount of time, we can train a model. So this is more for our uh, technical audience in here. You can see I went from data import to data visualization in under eight blocks of a Google Collab notebook. And I could have probably made it five, but I spread items out to make it easily readable. Here, we have the forecast head right here in block eight. So if you've worked with other implementations of R, Python, or even Julia, sometimes you'll be 20 blocks deep of code before you get your first estimation. This is, this is, friendly, this is friendly for your data scientists that you just onboarded you know, six months, a year ago. It doesn't take someone a decade of experience to sit with conformal prediction and, and leverage it. And that's one of the things that I found from a theoretical standpoint and a practical standpoint is uh, after you know 18 months of working with it, there's a comfort to it. Am I gonna call myself the world's leading expert in it? Absolutely not. We have, there's dozens of them on the last link if you wanna talk to a true expert who's been in the trenches for five plus years but after 18 months of using this there's clarity to it where if you've if you've ever cracked open a traditional time series forecasting textbook there's a lot of upper level you know graduate level master's phd level computational effort to it where you know, the creators of conformal prediction have broken, you know, and the other authors who have followed it, broken it down to a point to where you can take these numbers right here and you could plot this and you could show in a chart at timestamp 700 that the value is going to be between 1,500 and 2,800. So whether that's you're looking at 
you know, a particular store, you're looking at a particular item, you can take this in short order and not only make a numeric decision, but you can have a graphical representation of it that's explainable and repeatable. And that's one of the things that I have found with, with con conformal prediction intervals is that there's a great repeatability to it, right? Which is a hallmark of research and practical forecasting. If you run a forecast three times with the same data and same methodology, you should get the same results three times. And it should work on someone else's computer. So for the tech audience in here, you might appreciate that. Well, it worked on my computer, but not someone else's. That's another thing too. This analysis can be ported to work on, you know, multiple systems. So if you're running this, so generally you'll have in forecasting, you'll you'll run a forecast and then someone will replicate it with the right packaging and the right data storage techniques from, you know, at the organizational level, you can send this, this Python script over and you could have that confirmation in 15 minutes, 30 minutes, where you're not rebuilding your forecasting strategy. And if you put this in a container and containerize it, someone else picks up the container, they run it. And if you have the right virtual environment set up, it can be done in a virtual environment. There's a lot of flexibility outside of the theoretical guarantees from the actual interval itself, there's a lot of practical sense to it. And we can see here that the interval with a weaker fit will be larger. It's not conformal prediction intervals don't hide that. If you run an if you have a model that has variability, it doesn't hide that variability. You're not unsure, hmm, you know, with the high 90. I wonder what the high 90 difference is between idea. There's there's no there's no hiding. Conformal prediction intervals doesn't hide the bad either. It takes the data from a holistic standpoint with proven priors, which are your actuals, right? So if you're looking if you know going just to give a brief overview of forecasting, if I have 36 months of last actuals. It's not going to take the last actuals and do any type of transformation to them. It's going to say, well, here's your last actuals. Here's what the forecast is with those proven last actuals and the conditions built into the model. And if you, you know, if you had COVID data in there, for example, this was very prevalent in uh, e-commerce. Uh, the e-commerce picked up significantly, but in-store shopping was down. So if you look at inventory levels from April or May of 2020, they could be down here, but then, you know, your um, if your omni-channel, which is, means multiple channels of selling, your e-commerce could be up here. The formal prediction intervals, if you try to combine that data, is going to say, wait a minute, you've given me priors for this, but you also have priors in here for that it's not going to do any type of transformation where it hides that fact of, you know, there's a significant delta there. And perhaps you should split that data to where you're looking at it from the omni-channel perspective. You split your model where you're looking at in-store sales, you know, attrition and, you know, acquisition. And you look at omni-channel attrition and acquisition. And then you have those four models. And with those four models, you make conformal prediction intervals for each. So when you're presenting that to an executive, you say, well, here's our omni-channel attrition. Here's the 90% you know, prediction interval where we're at. Here's our acquisition conformal prediction interval. And then you can do the same thing with in-store sales, just like you would do, do with predictive maintenance. You wouldn't do the same predictive, you wouldn't do the same maintenance regimen on a bulldozer as you would a semi truck. You know, so if you have multiple lines or business verticals of equipment, 
you're not intermixing that, you're getting a true picture. So with that, let me stop sharing quick and go back. You know, so what's the takeaway? You know, so the first thing I want to be crystal clear on is outside of very specific models and in forecasting and generally, you're not going to remove all the noise. You know, especially when you add market forces, human variability and complex socioeconomic conditions. If you operate in multiple countries, your sales in the U.S. and, and your sales in the, in, the, you know, in the U.K. or Germany, are almost those conditions are different. You know, but what I can tell you is that conformal prediction intervals, you know, like what we've talked about the past hour, it offers a theoretical, practical, accessible and low cost alternative to other forecast casting metrics such as MAPE, uh, you know, MAE, root mean square of approximation to assessing the, the validity of your forecasting predictions. You know, will they work in every case and every, every use case in industry? No one can say that for sure. But what I can say, you know, and to, to both the technical and the non-technical audience that we have here today is opportunities you know when we looked at the potential the potential loss and uh slippage that we looked at in our uh, mape example there's opportunities to improve so i would encourage you to look over the the predictive and the validity that conformal prediction intervals have you know and go back and have a conversation with your data science team and you know take an opportunity to integrate it into a model now am i telling you to go put this in every model tomorrow no you have to look at your business conditions you have to look at what your current configuration is with your uh, tech stack and you have to be deliberate about it don't rush into forecasting for forecasting sake. But from what I've seen within the research, what I've seen, you know, putting this together and what I've seen in the past 18 months of using this for various applications is that conformal prediction and specifically conformal prediction intervals gives you an opportunity to truly narrow down what you're looking at from a data standpoint and it gives you an opportunity to narrow your focus. And anytime you can psychologically narrow your focus and look at something that's interpretable and actionable in a forecast, that's where you can generate better judgments. And that comes from chapter 26 of uh, A Flaw in Human Judgment. Certainly last but not least, here's the comprehensive conformal prediction resource. So I'll put that in the chat. It's uh, it's my go-to and it's uh, if you're looking to integrate it, if you're looking to learn more, if you want to get as technical as technical can get, you can go here. If you want a practical application again, and if you're looking at what you can do in the different programming languages, because again, not every enterprise uses the same programming language or same tech stack, you can look for configurations here. So with that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And it was great to uh, great to talk with everyone today.